Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of your Bish Therapist podcast. I am your host, Melissa Reich, your Bish Therapist, a real-life therapist turned pop culture aficionado, here to serve clinical interpretations and hot takes on all things pop culture. And today's episode is a very special episode. Please, 50 Cent, don't sue me. It's your bitch's birthday, y'all. I am so excited. Seriously, please don't sue me. Um, I just, you know, as an elder millennial, I love that song. <laughs> and it's my birthday. So today's episode of your Bish Therapist podcast is going to be about your Bish. Um, You know, for those of you who are new listeners to my podcast, I have an incredible life story. Um, I've had, I'm a two-time cancer survivor. Uh, Most people who listen to this podcast know that. But the, the, this week, so what is really special about my birthday? Um, well, number one, the very special thing about a birthday is that, you know, aging is a gift not given to all. Um, I am acutely aware of that. And so for me, uh, you will never hear me complain about getting older, about wrinkles, about gray hairs, which are starting to sprout (laughs) and wrinkles too. Um, I, I will just never complain about it because it it really is such a gift that we are all so lucky to have. And listen, I get, I'm not trying to shame people. I understand, you know, why birthdays can be hard for some people. I just share this perspective to try to, you know, help people look at, you know, each birthday is a gift. Um, I'll just say that. So not only is it my 43rd birthday, which, you know, I think I look pretty good for a 43-year-old. Those of you who are just listening to this on podcast, you can't see me, but on YouTube, you get you get the whole you get the whole deal. Um so um April 4th is my birthday and then April 6th is the 25-year anniversary of me being in remission from my first cancer, which is ovarian cancer. Um so today what I'm going to do a little bit is I'm going to share I'm not going to go into, you know, the whole story again. I do have an episode where I do that. So this is season 2 of your Bish Therapist podcast, but season 1 episode uh, four. It's called the one where your bish therapist tells her story, and in that episode, which you can get anywhere you listen to podcasts, I talk about um, surviving uh, ovarian cancer, but also getting to meet the cast of Friends. I talk about that experience in detail, so I'm not going to be so detailed about that today. Um, but one of the greatest gifts, for sure, that cancer ever gave me was being able to meet the cast of Friends. I got to make a wish through the Make a Wish Foundation. Um, that's where I met Matthew Perry, and I tell my story of how, like, he was kind of the first person to see me, which sounds bizarre. Um, so I, I talk a little a lot about that in that episode. So please do check that out. But today's episode, you know, for me with this platform that I have. I just want to be able to share my experience, strength, and hope because I know there's a lot of trauma survivors that listen to this. I know there's a lot of uh, chronic health warriors that listen to this. And so I think the best thing that I can do this week is to share a little bit about some of uh, life lessons that I've learned in, you know, an attempt to you know, my whole thing, whether it's reality TV or cancer, it's like, okay, so these things that are maybe toxic and not great, what can we, what lessons can we gain from this? What can we learn? Um, So that's kind of the way that I really like to approach pretty much everything. Um, So I just want to share a little bit, again, of my experience, strength, and hope with you all. Um, And then I'm going to give some health updates as well, because, you know, a lot of you are aware that, you know, I am dealing with a chronic cancer now. And, you know, that's a whole, a whole other sack of potatoes. So um, let me just start out by saying um, that for me this week is, I I guess I just want to be transparent in terms of like, if you're a survivor of complex trauma, whether it's you know, childhood trauma, medical trauma, all of the above. Um, I just want to normalize and validate that, like, for me this week, while I am so hyped and I'm so excited and I'm just really, 
the grateful. There's also a ton of grief that I'm processing. Like today I was kind of having a day and I was putting off recording this podcast because, you know, it's just, I, I've dealt with cancer for more than basically half my life at this point, more than half of my life. And, you know, it's exhausting. And I think that for me, one message that I just want to give to people is that grief, um, there's no end point, really, if I'm being honest. There's periods where it's better and there's periods where it's harder. And for, for me this week, um, when I'm talking about survivorship and I'm talking about you know, self-advocacy and things like that, there is just also a lot of grief wrapped up in that, right? Like, you know, picturing young me and, you know, really, I, I, I wasn't supposed to survive that cancer. So for me, these 25 years that I've gotten, if I'm being honest, I look at them as bonus years. Um, bonus years that, you know, when I was diagnosed the first time, I'll just, I'll just briefly tell the story. So when I was 17, um, my parents, I, I grew up in um, a suburb of Chicago called Downers Grove, Illinois. So shout out to all my DG people and beyond, all the Chicagoland area people. Um, I did a post on my stories asking people um, who follow me like to let me know if they're from Downers Grove or that area because I am going to be visiting and I was thinking about doing like a little listener meetup. Um, so if you're listening to this and you're interested in that, please email me and let me know um, because I may actually schedule that. But shout out to my family, my friends, all the people in that area that support me. Uh, I appreciate you so much. And my goal truly is to do a live show in Chicago. Um, that is a goal. I'm manifesting it because I don't think anyone cares now, but hopefully someday they will. <laughs> um, so when I was 17, my parents actually moved me from Downers Grove, Illinois, all my family and friends to Sugarloaf, Pennsylvania, which is, is as small as it sounds. And um, when, so I was a new kid in a new school. And immediately, as soon as we moved, I started getting sick. And it's a very long story, uh, a very long, painful story. I'm not going to go into the whole thing, but... So I was misdiagnosed for so long because I just wasn't listened to. Um, you know, teenagers, th this is why I'm such a fierce advocate for teenagers because, um, you know, when I, I would go to the doctors and they would say, oh, well, you're just stressed because you moved or you have a, you're a teenager, you have a poor diet. And by the way, I was like 5'8", like 100 pounds. I was actually underweight. Um, and so... <laughs> So what I want to talk about today is just self-advocacy because I have saved my own life on more than one occasion. So essentially what happened um, with the first situation is I just kept, um, I just kept saying, I, I feel like I'm dying. Like something is very wrong here. And I was. And so by the time I got diagnosed, it was, and this was in 1998, um, cancer research and treatment and technology has never been better, thank goodness. But at that time, it was bleak. Um, so I was diagnosed with end-stage ovarian cancer, and um, there were doctors who didn't even want to treat me. My parents took me to Hershey Medical Center, and um, they recommended hospice. So my parents took me to Penn Medicine, who, you know, they did tell my parents that likely I wouldn't survive. They actually suggested that they start making arrangements for me. Yikes. And, um, but they would do everything that they could. And so April 6th to me, you know, so imagine this. So I turn 18 in 1999 <clears throat> on April 4th. And then two days later, we get the call that I'm somehow in remission. It was just it was a wild time. And like, you have to keep in mind too. So I'm a new kid at a new school. I have no friends. I have no support. And then I get cancer and people treated me like it was contagious. It's not like you see on TV or, you know, the fault in our stars or stuff like that. I did not get support. I did not get people driving by my house when I was home too sick to go to school. I did not get cards and support. I got none of that. I got people treating me like I was an alien. And I've never felt so isolated and alone. And I look back at that time and I just, I grieve for that Melissa because I don't know how she did it. Like I'm, it's me 
spoiler alert, it's me. <laughs> but like, I look back on that and I think, how did I do that? I just don't know. Um, so I grieve for her. I grieve for, you know, just that sad, isolated experience, you know, being on an island and then you know, having to deal with this tough stuff. And, you know, it was just, it was really challenging. So when I found out that I was in remission, this was April 6th of 1999. And don't forget, like, I was a senior in high school. And so everyone was applying to colleges and getting ready to go to colleges, but I hadn't even applied because why would I apply to college if I'm not going to live to go? So they were like, oh, surprise, you're in remission. Now apply to college and just go. And it was like, uh, 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 okay. <laughs> and I think the wildest thing for me, the difference now in 2024 versus then is like, not one person ever asked me, like, how are you feeling? Not one person. Like, nobody. It was just so weird. Like, to, and I know I'm sorry, I'm saying like a lot. I'm just, you know. It's just, it was such a wild experience. No one asked how I was feeling. And in fact, the doctor said to me, and, and this is how me being a therapist came about, by the by. So my doctors and my team said, wow, you're really dealing with this so well. And spoiler alert, I wasn't. I was traumatized and I was frozen in like this trauma response, but it looked like to everybody else that I was stoically handling this well. Um, and I wasn't. And so, um, you know, they were like, wow, you should really look into, you know, helping other patients or, you know, whatever. And so that start, started to plant the seed in terms of ignoring my own needs and taking care of everybody else's. So that wasn't a great start. But, you know, so I end up, I go to college and, you know, I get on this path of, you know, being a therapist. And, you know, listen, I feel that the last 25 years, I got to experience the most amazing things. I got to go to college and uh, go to graduate school, get my degrees, become a therapist, learn how to help people while also helping myself and focusing on myself. That was the greatest, um, you know, thing to come out of all of this. You know, I got to meet and marry the love of my life, my husband. I met him in college and I got to, my sister gave me the three best gifts on the planet, my two nieces and my nephew, who are the literal loves of my life. I got to see them being born. My first niece, I helped deliver her. It was amazing. Um, they are my absolute loves of my life. And, and so I just look back at these 25 years, you know, and there's some grief and, you know, wow, imagine if I had never experienced this, but also I'm so grateful that I have. And as a cancer survivor, it's complicated grief because it's like, you know, I've lost a lot of friends over the years um, due to this disease. And so there's survivor's guilt and there's, you know, it's just a complex time. So I'm sharing this all to just kind of validate and support people listening to this. I mean, as well as myself, you know, I've been through a lot. Um, so I guess what I'll talk about next is the fact that I want to share a little bit about like ovarian cancer. And, you know, there is so much good research and technology in terms of cancer today. Um, <clears throat> survivor rates are going up. Um, people I think are listening better because what, one of my major things that I advocate about is medical, uh, gaslighting. So I advocate for people who've been medically gaslit to be clear. I don't advocate for medical gaslighting. <laughs> um, but I was so medically gaslit for so many years. And I, so part of what my grief experience is now is to think how different my life and my body could have been um, if I was listened to, right? Because when you have a cancer that gets the chance to develop so significantly, um, unfortunately, I'm now in the place with my body where I'm just going to be chronically ill. And that's just how it's going to be. And, you know, it never occurred to me that one day I would wake up and never get better. And so I think that the greatest, you know, cancer's taken a lot for me. It's taken my organs. It's taken, you know, my ability to have children. It's taken my hair. It's taken, you know, self-esteem. It's, it's taken a lot for me. Um, but also what it's given me is wisdom, insight, strength, courage, you know, I, I, so it's like this fine line between appreciating, um, 
how I've gotten here because we can't wish for both an easy life and strong character. I always say that. And so I'm grateful to have strong character. I guess I just wish, you know, it's hard um, to think about how traumatized I've had to be to get that strong character, but here we are. So I encourage all women listening to this, women, men, um, non-binary, irrespective of gender and sexual orientation, okay, just to be really clear about any of that, gender identity, sexual orientation, any of it, is that we have to be our own best advocates. And in fact, so I'm going to I'm going to show this to the YouTube audience. The people who are listening to this on on the podcast won't be able to see this. I'll I'll explain it to you, though. So in my last podcast, I talk a lot about self-advocacy, right? Um, Obviously, I've had to save my own life a couple of times, and I talked about we need to be our own number one fan, and I joked about getting a foam finger. Well, guess what, y'all? Here she is. (laughs) For those of you who are listening and not watching this on YouTube... My very dear friend, Katie Matthews, shout out to Katie. Thank you, my dear. She got me this Your Bish Therapist foam finger, and it's blue, which is my favorite color. Um, And this is the new mascot of the show. It's I'm holding it right now, and it's literally a foam finger that says Your Bish Therapist. So for me, every time I talk about self-advocacy, I'm going to be using this little foam finger because we really do have to be our own best advocates. I don't care how good a doctor is. You are the expert of your body. Nobody knows what it's like to feel what you're feeling other than you. So doctors and practitioners may be the expert in their field, but they're not the expert of your body. So I just want to be really clear about that. Um, And if you go, you feel that something's wrong and you feel that you're not getting the right answer, listen to your gut. Unfortunately, um, I'm able to self-advocate now for myself in ways that I wasn't before because I was a minor. Um, and so, you know, I could advocate all I want, but I was a minor and my parents were in charge and they were in charge of advocating for me. Um, and unfortunately, you know, that didn't always work so well. So I'm proud that I'm able to do this now, but I just want to use this very loud voice and experience to tell you that if you're feeling something's wrong, do not stop until you get an answer. Because women especially, and this is where I will talk about specifically women, we are medically gaslit more consistently than other folks, and especially women of color. Um we are told we're crazy. So I was told twice, by the way, that I was a hypochondriac and both times it was cancer. So, um, you know, it's wild. It's absolutely so wild. And again, what I want to make something good out of all of this. And so, you know, sharing this with you all is the best I can do. So my point is that listen to your gut. I think that we would all be better off if we just listened to our guts, our gut intuition, because your gut is never wrong. It's do you listen to it or not? Um, You know, there used to be, (laughs) I know this is kind of wild, but in the 50s, there, or maybe a little bit earlier than that, 40s or 50s, there was um, a diagnosis in the DSM for women, I think it was like called hysteria or something. And the treatment for it was for doctors to give women an orgasm, and sometimes without their consent. Um, And here's why I share that. Because that was in the like, 40s and the 50s. And this is 2024. That wasn't that long ago. So I just think that what I'm saying is, is that the medical model sometimes does like to really discount uh, women as, you know, kind of the old adage of like, bitches be crazy. And I'm just, I'm just here to rail against that with every breath in my body. Okay. You know you better than anyone else knows you, and that's it. And by the way, I've fired many doctors, um, many, 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 and therapists. And so I think it's having the confidence in yourself to know that if if this person or this situation isn't serving you to get you to the wellness uh, place that you want to be, well, you have to find someone who it, it does make sense for you to see them. 
um, just to be really clear about that. So with ovarian cancer, I just think that, you know, there are such great treatments out there today. Um, There is so much advancement, but I just want women to be aware of the signs and the symptoms, Um, bloating, diarrhea and constipation, um, belly pain, uh, you know, abdominal distension, which is kind of like swelling and, um, you know, bloated, but it just, it, it's a little bit more intense than that. Uh, lack of appetite. Um, you know, so, and of course anyone can Google this, but like the one thing that I will say is if you have a family history of cancer, the one thing I highly recommend is genetic testing. Um, most hospitals, you have to dig a little bit and of course self-advocate to find it, but most hospital or insurance companies have some sort of coverage for it. So I was able to get genetic testing a couple of times. And what's wild about my genetic testing is that uh, I have no real genetic um, mutations that explain the wild medical history that I've had. However, I have a genetic mutation that's, it's called undetermined. So basically genetics is truly in its its childhood, its infancy, um, in terms of everything we're learning and how much it's growing. And so I have a variant of unknown etiology, which means that it's just not studied. So my variant that I have, we could end up finding out one day that it is a hugely major important genetic you know, factor, it, but we just don't have that knowledge now. But if there's a history of breast cancer, ovarian cancer, colon cancer, Lynch syndrome, all these other things, please, I recommend genetic testing. Please, please, please. It's, you know, they just take a little bit of blood. It's really not scary or complex. And to me, knowing is better than not knowing. You know, I know a lot of people, sometimes there's an avoidance with health, but please take it from me. You don't want to do that because avoiding something is the surefire way to make it worse, whether it's mental, physical, emotional, what have you. Avoidance is not good. So, um, you know, I would just encourage people to look into that because there are a lot of folks who they call themselves previvors, which means they find out that they have a BRCA gene um, or they have a gene uh, that indicates, you know, breast or ovarian cancer. There's not, there's more than just the BRCA genes, but you owe it to yourself to find out, you know, there are people who find out. And then, for example, Morgan Wade, she found out that she had some genetic mutations that made her very likely to develop breast cancer. And so she did um, a uh, bilateral mastectomy, which insurance companies will cover if you do test positive for this gene. Um, And again, it's not always the right choice for everyone, but they call it being a previvor. And I just think that whatever you need to do to take care of yourself and to get yourself well, do that, please. And if that doesn't feel right for you, then that's fine too. But just please don't ignore your, your, your genetic history is all I'm saying. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about PTSD, so acute versus complex, um, because what I will say is that I do not believe that there is enough mental health treatment or focus for cancer patients, period. There, It's better now than it used to be. So now... Um, there are, you know, you go to the doctor and they'll, you might find that they'll do screenings about your happiness, if you felt depressed or anxious, if you're feeling safe at home, things like that. This is new. This is not stuff that they used to do. And it is stuff, and it is, it, you should continue to do this because I don't care what kind of cancer you have, all cancer survivors develop some sort of post traumatic stress disorder because when you're told that you're dying or that, you have cancer and your life is being threatened um, and you're undergoing these treatments and surgeries and all these things, there's going to be trauma there. And if you ignore it, like I did, um, well, mostly because I was taking the cues of people around me, but if you ignore it, then it becomes what is called complex PTSD, which is something that um, I have and will deal with for the rest of my life. So acute PTSD is something like if you get diagnosed with cancer or a really terrible medical, because by the way, cancer is not the only terrible medical 
health issue, right? If you're diagnosed with a chronic health issue or a neurological issue that, you know, has really severe implications, it is so hard to live and try to have like a healthy, productive life and not over-focus on the fact that like something's actively trying to like hurt you in your body. It's just such a weird feeling. So I just want to advocate for, you know, for folks who have gone through that. And if you've been told or dismissed that, you know, you should just get over it. Well, that's nonsense. Um, and if you are concerned about PTSD, please, um, you know, I, 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 my last episode, I talked about um, a lot of resources for finding therapists and things like that. So please listen to that episode. It was a better health, helping or harming. And in that, there's just a ton of resources for finding a therapist, for good online therapy platforms. Um, but whatever it is, just get the help that you deserve. Because now that I'm trying to kind of crawl out of this rubble of, um, trauma and grief, it would have been a lot easier to do before it was like all consuming. Um, so I just encourage people to do that. So I'm going to give a quick current health update. Um, because I know I posted something and people have been uh, curious as to what's going on. And here's the thing. So I do allude to health challenges, but I don't always... <laughs> share specifically what is happening because to be honest, it's overwhelming for me. And I just think that it would be too stressful for people. But um, this is going to be the one and only time I kind of like give an update or talk about some of the other issues that I'm dealing with, just so people kind of understand. Um, and again, maybe feel validated or heard by something that I've said. So I despite being in remission from ovarian cancer for 25 years. Oh, and by the way, I do have to say this. So I've actually had two hysterectomies, which was atrocious. Um, the first hysterectomy that I had was a partial one to, um, they tr because I was so young, they wanted to keep my uterus in the event that I wanted to try to have children somehow. And, you know, my husband and I were talking about it. We had moved, uh, we bought a house and, you know, we bought one in a good school district because I thought that, you know, maybe I was going to try to figure out whether it be adoption or, you know, uh, egg donor, something like that. And then in 2014, um, I was diagnosed with CLL. So for me, when I talk about grief, and I just want people to outline this, is that sometimes grief can build on itself. Like, I feel like I lost my ability to have children when I was young. And then when I was, re when I was diagnosed with another cancer, I kind of felt like I lost it again, just because I didn't, for me, I didn't want to bring a child into what I knew was going to be my life, right? I didn't, you know, I'm tired a lot and I don't have the energy. And for me, I would want to give the best possible life to a child. And I, you know, it was just a decision that I had to make. And so there's days where I'm like so grateful because some days I can barely get off the couch. And then there's some days where it's really hard and I'm feeling a lot of grief. So those of you who are on a grief journey know that it's okay and it's normal to have ebbs and flows of grief. That's just, you know, grief is the excruciating price of love and loss. And, you know, it's, it, it's a wild experience, but like, you're not alone and it's normal. Um, so back to, I was diagnosed with CLL in 2014 and at the time that I was diagnosed with CLL, by the way, the medication that I'm on now didn't even exist. That is how far technology has come for blood cancer. And so I'll briefly explain CLL. What CLL is, it's, it's short for chronic lymphocytic leukemia, small cell lymphoma, and it's a chronic cancer, meaning you have it forever, and there's no true remission with it like there are for other cancers. So for example, my ovarian cancer, I've been in remission from that for 25 years. Yay. CLL, there's no remission. Um, and here's what's wild about CLL. 
when I was the doctor who told me that I had it, he said it was a good cancer. And I was like, what the fuck does that mean? A good cancer. And so here's what I've come to learn about CLL. There are two different types of CLL, okay? There's people who get it when they're elderly. So like if you Google it, they'll say that it's the most common blood cancer and it's usually found in elderly people. And so if you're 70 or 80 years old and you get CLL and you have 10 years to live, it's like, well, great. Who cares? I mean, with all due, right? (laughs) It's like if you've lived to be 70 or 80 and like you're, you know, yeah, great. But when you're diagnosed with it, when you're 35 years old, that's a very different course, if I'm being honest. So the whole good cancer thing really enrages me because it's like, well, would you want a chronic cancer with no remission and no cure for your whole life? Like that just seems so bizarre. Um, So I think that you know, there there are this whole group of young folks like myself who have CLL. And what, what happens with this disease is people who are younger tend to have a more aggressive, problematic course of disease. People who are getting this when they're older, they may never even need treatment. So there are two different experiences with this. Um, and the treatment for CLL used to be chemotherapy. And so when I was diagnosed in 2014, um, all of my doctors, and of course I need a team because I'm a medical unicorn. So I have some medical issues that doctors have never seen in real life. They've only read about until me, um, which is a weird flex, but I don't know. That's how it is. Um, and so I have this medical team because my situation is complex. And when I was first diagnosed, they were like, well, there's the, the, only real treatment for this right now is chemotherapy and you've already had chemotherapy. And so we don't recommend that because likely the reason why I have CLL is because of, you know, the chemotherapy that I was exposed to. It's, you know, from toxins and things like that. That's usually what leukemias are. Um, Now there are other causes and other things. So just don't at me, but this has been my experience. Most people have had some sort of exposure to some sort of like toxin or whatever. Um, And so what I had to do was just hold out as long as I could for a good treatment. And so my course of my disease has been my my pen doctor, who, by the way, so he is currently on sabbatical right now um, doing the research for folks like me. And I'm just so proud of him and I love him so much. And I tell him all the time, I'm like, you can never retire. You have to work till you're 150. I need you. Um, So there has been major breakthroughs in CLL. In fact, last week, I found out that there is the, for the first time, there is CART T treatment for people with CLL who have failed other treatments. And so I will give a quick, quick update for me. Um, the course of my CLL treatment has been tough. I waited five years. Um, I just sucked it up. All my swollen lymph nodes, chronic headaches, constant neck pain, swollen spleen, all of this stuff, right? I just sucked it up and I just handled it until there was a good treatment for me to go on. And then I went on that during the pandemic, unfortunately, but you know, such is life. And I've been on treatment for the last four years. Okay. So immunotherapy treatment, it's a more targeted treatment than chemotherapy, but it's really not all that different. It's very toxic. It comes in a medical waste bag. My husband cannot touch the medication. And if he does, we have to call poison control. And it's like, is that better? (laughs) Like I've been on this for four years. I'm lucky I don't have like a third eye growing out of my forehead. (laughs) So, um, so it's like while I'm while I'm grateful and I'm I'm happy for for you know this medical technology it is really hard on the body and so over the past 4 years I have just had a lot of my health has just kind of decompensated um just due to the nature of all the treatments that I've gotten and you know so that's just unfortunately kind of how it is but what started happening was last year I started having um, cardiac problems. So I had to wear a, um, one of those, they like, it's like a cardiac patch that it's six, it's called the Zeo patch for those of you who some people will know what that is, but it, I had to wear it for two weeks. And I swear that was like the worst torture. My skin afterwards was just like a red 
irritated pile of, oh, it was awful. However, we realized that um, the immunotherapy started to give me cardiac problems, which it apparently can do that after a certain period of time. So for me, it happened a little earlier than it happens to most, most folks, lucky me. So what had to happen is that I cannot go back on a full dose and I am on a half a dose. And the half a dose was working great, and now it has plateaued. So what that means for me is more patience. Um, I am stable, but not progressing. And sometimes with CLL, stability is the best thing that you can hope for. My MRI showed some lymph node growth, um, but nothing to be alarmed about. And so even though there are new treatments for CLL, like this CAR-T therapy, unfortunately what happens is that... um, you have to be kind of on death's doorstep to be able to access that intervention, um, which that's just how it is. And so thankfully, I'm not on death's doorstep. I'm still stable. And for me, it is just enough to know that that can be a possibility that just it, it, it took away so much of my anxiety. Um, because what people don't know is that a couple months ago, I was really going back and forth about whether I could continue to do this or not. Um, podcasting, I mean, because, you know, my health was in such a precarious place, which put my mental health in a precarious place. And my therapist and I had conversations about, um, you know, being in this realm is hard. I get a lot of criticism. People are really mean, um, which like, I get it, but you know, I expected it, but just as a sensitive person, it just doesn't feel good. And so my therapist and I, we had like a come to Jesus moment where it was like, you either, I either needed to learn how to do this and not let it impact me, or I couldn't continue to do it. So fortunately for everybody, I made the decision to just like work on not letting it impact me. And I've been doing a great job. In fact, I'm sure some people are going to be annoyed about this podcast that it's not about whatever they want to hear me talk about. Sometimes people treat me like I'm a toy or a plaything that's just for their enjoyment. And I'm a person, you know, and so that doesn't feel great, but I am learning to, I'm learning to manage that. Um, so what we're doing right now with my CLL is just being patient, continuing half the dose, meeting with my care team every three months, continuing to get blood work, continuing to monitor, but in the meantime, not letting it completely take up my headspace. So it's kind of turned me into like a Zen master, right? Because what the gift that this has given me is the gift of mindfulness and radical acceptance. Radical acceptance is a a phrase we use um, in some different therapy modalities, just about Radical acceptance is about accepting what is without putting emotional quantifiers to it. Like, it sucks that I have this cancer that's going to be forever unless there's a great treatment that comes out for it, but, I, but I've accepted it. And with that comes accepting that I have no control. I, like, a lot of people listening to this right now are probably going to be like, what the hell? But if we start to have radical acceptance and understanding that we don't have control over really anything, there's a lot of freedom in that. I know that sounds counterintuitive. And another thing I'm going to share with you is that there's um, something called the stoicism, which is like an ancient philosophical approach uh, to life that I personally um, love. And it makes a lot of sense to me. And there's something called memento mori, which is Latin for um, remember that you will die. And so there are philosophers that have spent lifetimes figuring out like how, so this one philosopher, to practice death is to practice freedom. A man who has learned how to die has unlearned how to be a slave. Um, So for me, it's like, we're all dying every day. For me, I'm just more acutely aware of it. I mean, truly. And so, you know, I want that to be empowering. I don't want that to be anxiety provoking or, or what have you. But for me, Memento mori and radical acceptance and accepting the lack of control, it has been my only path to freedom. That's it. So that's why I share it with you. If it sounds wild, if it doesn't make sense to you, that's fine. It may not be for you, but for me, this is how I have learned to manage mindfulness, right? So, like, for example, if this were to be the last week of my life, what would I want to be doing? And then just do that. You know what I mean? Like make that the center of what your life is. So for example, 
this week, I want I would want to be spending time with my husband and my nieces and nephew and my closest friends and doing this, right? Living my passion, doing my podcast, um, you know, doing my clinical interpretations. So for me, how I live on a day-to-day basis is through that lens of if this were the last day of my life or the last week of my life would I be doing something that I love and I'm happy? And yes, the answer is yes. So listen, and I know we're not all, that's a privilege for me to be able to say that. It it is a privilege because not everybody is privileged enough to be able to follow their passions and to do things that they love um, because they have to work for a living and support their children and raise families and all these things. So I understand that there's some privilege associated with this, but there are also ways, despite wherever you lie in terms of socioeconomic status, there's a way to, at the end of the day, when you put your head on the pillow, are you proud of who you were as a person? And for me, that's all I have, right? I have mindfulness and I have that. And so I just feel really proud of myself. I feel proud for everything that I've survived. Um, And I feel proud to just be able to look back at all of this and to share some of this with people and hope that it just helps a couple people. Um, But going back to some of my health issues, so not only am I dealing with CLL, um, I also have something called hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is a connective tissue disease in, um, it's hard to explain. So all of my joints are hypermobile, my arms, my legs, my back, my neck, everything. So they bend too far the wrong way. And because of that, my ligaments and my joints are completely jacked up for lack of a better term. Um, and so I have chronic pain and I have chronic, uh, dislocation. So I have chronic shoulder dislocations, um, that sometimes not going to lie, I'm a real badass and I just pop them right back in. I saw an orthopedist and he's like, don't do that anymore. I'm like, okay, well. Um, so I have chronic pain because of that, like from head to toe, truly. Um, and here's the weird thing. I do live by something called acting opposite. So for example, when I'm in a bad mood or when I'm physically having a tough day, I will act opposite and I will... Um, do a little exercise, a little stretching, a little movement. And it sounds counterintuitive, but it does help me feel better. So I think it's just finding whatever works best for you with the issues that you have. But I like, I just like sharing that term act opposite. So another example, if my husband's driving me crazy and he's annoying me, I'm going to love him and kiss on him and do the opposite of what I want to do, which is lightly stab him. (laughs) Just kidding. I love him a lot, but people who've been married a long time, you'll, you'll get that joke. Um, and so the ho- hypermobile Eilers Danlos is really challenging. But in addition to that, I also have um, a movement disorder, which is a tremor in my head and my hands. So people who watch this on YouTube, there's times where my head will just kind of do a little wibble wobble. And um, that's just, you know, I just have this tremor that's... Um, that's just how it is. And the same thing with my hands. My hands are arthritic and they're not super um, dexterous and they do shake a lot too, which people love to point out when I'm in public, which is just why. So awkward. Just like, I know, I know I have it. Like, give me a break. Um, I also have Hashimoto's disease, which is, so my thyroid is just like completely uncontrolled despite seeing a million doctors and medication management. And so it goes from hypo to hyper. And, you know, I have a lot of underlying inflammatory stuff with the Hashimoto's. Um, I also, oh my gosh, I also have Raynaud's disease, which is where all of my extremities, um, hands, ears, toes, and a couple other places that are kind of embarrassing. So I'm not going to share, but um, they turn blue. And then when they're starting to get blood back in them, they're like white and red and white. And then it's like pain. So it's like, for example, if my fingers, like if I touch something cold, it feels like I'm being electrocuted, like in my fingertips, which I mean, honestly, it's not the worst thing in the world. It's like the least of my problems, if I'm being honest, it's just like annoying. Um, So in the winter, I have to be mindful, you know, wearing gloves and like, the winter season is tough for me because inside the house, I do have um, a really lovely pair of Ugg earmuffs that I wear inside because it's like really bad in my ears and it just feels painful. It kind of feels like like uh, fire ants, like in my 
in my extremities. It's very weird. Um, so essentially what I'm saying is that every major system in my body is dysfunctional from my endocrine system to my cardiac system, uh, my digestive and GI system is an absolute disaster. Um, and you know, it's, it's sometimes I just feel like I'm, I'm a ship that's taking on water and all I can just do is bail the water, <laughs> you know, and just keep bailing and bailing and bailing until, you know, those holes can be patched up and, you know, I'm just doing my best. So that's kind of, for me, um, that's where I'm at. Please know that I am okay. I will be okay. I'm too good at managing all of this. And so I will continue to manage it. And listen, this is where I talk about the intersection of grief and happiness, okay? Is that you can't have, you can't truly appreciate the full experience of happiness when you haven't had the other side of that, which is depression or grief or, you know, whatever it is. It's like having them both makes you appreciate the other moments, if that makes sense. So for me, there's this elegant, elegant dance of happiness and joy and grief and sadness. And it is a dance I'll be doing forever. And that's all I can say about it. I'm okay with it. I am at the most best equipped that I've ever been for it at this point in my life right now. Um, I have a really great support system, small, but great. Um, I, but the most important thing, and I'm going to bring back out my foam finger. My most important difference now is I'm my own number one fan and I'm holding up my phone finger, foam finger again. Okay. So this is the major difference. Now I have my own back. I love me. I support me. I'm my own number one fan. And for me, that has made all the difference Um, because during the pandemic, it was hard for me. People where I lived, they just didn't think that I would, not just where I live, across the country, there was this rhetoric that like you weren't valuable. You weren't a valued person. If you had If you were immunocompromised, like Kelly Dodd, again, I will just never forget or get over that she said this, is that it's God's way of thinning the herd. And I just felt like, wow, so I'm disposable as a person to you. That's wild. And it wasn't just Kelly Dodd who held those opinions. Lots of people hold opinions about people with chronic illness or mental health issues that were disposable. And it's like... couldn't be further from the truth because trauma survivors, chronic health warriors, these are some of the most amazingly beautiful souls that I've ever met. And I think that once you're really tested with a life stuff, it does, it makes you better or it makes you bitter. And I, you know, as I talked about in my last couple of podcasts, I'm always going to choose Batman over the Joker. That's just always how it's going to be. I'm going to use my experience to grow, to continue to help myself and live the absolute best life I can live because I deserve that. And I encourage you all to do the same. So I think that's going to be the end of this episode. I think that, you know, I appreciate all of your support so much. You just have no idea. Um, And I'm just so grateful that I continue to survive. I continue to thrive. Um, which wasn't always the case, by the way. So if you're listening to this and you're just surviving, that's okay. There was a a long period of time where I was just surviving and I was not thriving. And I always wanted to get here and I never thought I would, but here I am. And the answer was, again, all the things I've said, super hard work and therapy, self-examination, radical acceptance, accepting that I don't have control over things, and just except for how how I feel and how I express my emotions, right? That's really all we can control. Um, And so I'm doing that and I've never felt freer. So that's ironic, but it is possible you can get here. And if you're not, please just be gentle with yourself. Um, So before I end the podcast, one thing I will say is that People have been asking for ways to support me, which I really appreciate. And so this has been hard for me because I'm not great at asking for help. Um, and there are lots of reasons for that, mostly because I didn't get a lot. So I, what I'm trying to say is that people, you know, have said, well, how can we do a Patreon? How can we support? So what I've set up, I've set up two things. And again, 
please, this is, there's no expectations on my end. You know, finances can be tough. We all need our resources for ourselves. So if this doesn't make sense, then please, no worries. But um, so Spreaker has a supporters club where I have set that up for people. And thank you to those of you who have joined. I really appreciate you. It's a small group, but I'm so appreciative. And you can find that um, wherever you listen to this podcast, I'm going to put in the bottom of it, the link to the Spreaker. It's called the Supporters Club. But you can also just go to Spreaker.com and look up my podcast and then there's a way to support it. You just click support. Um, so that's one thing that I have set up and I am doing um, extra uh, content for those supporters. I am going to start doing that uh, once a month at least. And then if I get more supporters, I'll, I'll certainly do more. And the other thing that has happened is I hit 10,000 followers on Instagram. Thank you to you all who really, you know, my girls, my content creator, my fellow Bravo content creators, my loves, thank you for helping me push through to that. Um, so on Instagram, I am now offering subscriptions. Um, for $5 a month, Spreaker, it's the same thing. We're talking $5 here. Again, if you want to support me and for the people on Instagram, if you'd like to become a subscriber, I will do special um, additional, I should say, content for those folks as well. So there's two ways that you can do that. Um, Instagram is your Bish Therapist on Instagram. I'm also your Bish Therapist on TikTok. Um, the Spreaker Supporters Club, as I mentioned, and the link to that is on my Instagram as well. If you just wanted to click it and go over to it, the link to that's on my Instagram. Um, and please go over and give me a five-star review. If you're enjoying this podcast, I greatly appreciate it. Um, I really want to say that I appreciate the people who have really helped just be my advocates and support me. Um, it's truly meant the world to me. I don't think people will fully understand that it really is very meaningful to me, but hopefully you hear what I'm saying and understand that. Um, so for now, I'm going to say, please remember to take care of yourselves and each other. Um, and I'm just going to have a wonderful next, you know, week and a half, just celebrating my birthday, my cancerversary and just love and life. So thank you to you all. Appreciate you very much. Disclaimer, posts are not intended to diagnose, treat, or provide medical advice. Your Bish Therapist is for entertainment and informational purposes only. The podcast, my opinions, and posts are my own and are not associated with past or present employers, any organizations, Bravo TV, Greyheart Productions, or any other television network. The information in YBT Podcast and on its social media is provided for general informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose or treat. Please do not act or refrain from acting based on anything you read, see, or here on YBT Podcast or associated social media. Communicating with YBT via email um, and or social media does not form a therapeutic alliance. Melissa, operator of YBT, is unable to provide any therapeutic advice, treatment, or feedback.